Hey there everyone, AJ back again for the Mighty Gloostick channel. I make videos about Dungeons and Dragons lore full time and have a collection of over 600 videos on monster ecology, fantasy world history, fantasy locations, character classes, world settings, magic items and so on. If you like what I do, please consider becoming a member of the channel by clicking the join button down below or backing me on Patreon where you can get full access to all of these scripts I wrote for these videos. Those who are members also get advanced access to the videos before anybody else and become members of the secretive Gloominati uh, on the Discord server. And of course, subscribing to me here as I upload at least twice a week and have a live stream every weekend. So if you click that notification bell, you'll see these videos uh, when I upload them first thing in the morning. This is a viewer requested video. Glad I can finally get along to doing these ones at last. Sorry for the wait, Theo. Meanlocks are horrible little monsters, far more dangerous than their small size and feeble, sickly appearance suggests. They are perfectly suited for a dark and confined encounter where you can make best use of the horror aspect of these evil fey, which I've seen described as the most unseely of the unseely court. The origin of the Meanlock is tied to the nature of the Feywild itself, a plane of strange supernatural laws which respond to story and emotion as if they were real physical energy. The plane is a reflection of the natural world of the Prime Material Plane, but the vast majority of the Prime Material Plane is a mysterious rainbow ocean within the Phlogiston Expanse, peppered with enormous crystal spheres that contain what those with, who live within like to think is the normal environment of the prime material plane. A star of some kind, planets, water, atmosphere, life, civilizations, convinced that everything around them is normal and stable. The Feywild and Shadowfell reflect both the pockets of intelligent species in their frenetic lives and the dizzying gulfs of swirling currents inhabited by ancient beings with very different ways of thinking. The Feywild is, in a way, a bridge to the higher realms of belief and creation. It reflects fable, fairy tales, spooky stories, and dark secrets hidden within innocent nursery rhymes. The darkness is always there, lurking beneath the brightest surface, waiting for the cracks to appear so that the evil can come out and play. Volo's Guide to Monsters tells us that the Meanlocks are spawned by fear. Whenever fear overwhelms a creature in the Feywild or in any other location where the Feywild's influence is strong, one or more Meanlocks might spontaneously arise in the shadows or darkness nearby. If more than one Meanlock is born, a lair also magically forms. The earth creaks and moans as narrow, twisting tunnels open up within it. One of these newly formed passageways serves as the lair's only entrance and exit. Or it could be that fear is the key to a nightmare realm of the Meanlocks that has nothing but burrows and foul grottos choked with roots and the grim trophies of their many excursions into other realms. When the fear is great enough far, uh, for more than one or two of them to slip through, they can open a portal in the form of a sub-burrow that inserts itself into the other realm and detaches from the home of the Meanlocks. The Meanlocks do have the power to teleport short distances when they are in dim light and darkness, so perhaps it is through this burrow realm that they're moving, a bit like Nightcrawler from the X-Men transports himself through another dimension resulting in a sulfurous plume when he arrives on the other side. The Meanlocks are not able to take creatures from other realms with them as they teleport this way, so perhaps the burrow is only accessible to Meanlocks. Thanks to earlier editions, we know far more about the exact nature of the Meanlock's burrowed lairs and their very limited form of society. They are intelligent creatures, though it is an intellect twisted and cruel, forged from the ravaged form and their loathsome appetites. It's more common for moments of great fear to occur in dark and dreary places, so Meanlocks tend to inhabit spooky and remote areas. Their burrow lairs forming in desolate, rocky forests covering the entrance with a large flat rock they conceal as best they can. This stone opens to a twisting vertical passageway that winds downward to, oh, I'll say 100 feet or more to the Meanlock's main lair. A big cavern, a ceiling, floor and vertical passageway of the entire lair are covered with a dank, spongy, loathsome moss, unique to the Meanlock's realm, which serves to soak up pools of slime and gore muffling the sounds of the Meanlocks as they creep around. Meanlocks use this moss to climb up and down the vertical passage. Their hands and feet have hooked claws well suited to this method of travel. Otherwise, they tend not to climb very much because they, they prefer to be under the surface rather than high above it. Anyone pushing back the secret stone door and opening their lair senses powerful emanations of evil coming from below. In addition, anyone peering into the darkness is greeted by the smell of rotting corpses. Both of these sensations are telepathic, 
warnings from the mean locks below. Though granted, the smell of corpses is all too often quite real the deeper into the lair one travels. The mean locks live in a dreary chamber at the bottom of the vertical passageway. Decorations within consist of ratty and infested sleeping furs, a number of wicked curved knives hanging on the walls, a jumble of pile of bones, and they may fill pilfered urns with the decaying corpses of victims who did not survive their horrid feeding. All mean locks give other creatures the creeps and project a telepathic aura that instills terror in those nearby. In 5th edition, up to 4 mean locks can telepathically torment one incapacitated creature, filling its mind with disturbing sounds and dreadful imagery. Participating mean locks can't use their telepathy for any other purpose during this time, but they're totally focused on their victim. But they can move around and take actions and reactions as normal while they're doing so. This torment has no effect on a creature that is immune to the frightened condition, so mean locks will tend to avoid them or just outright murder them. If the creature is susceptible and remains incapacitated for an hour, the creature must make a wisdom saving throw taking 3d6 psychic damage on a failed save, or half as much damage on a successful one. The save DC is 10 plus the number of mean locks participating in the torment, so from 11 to 14 the difficulty class considering only those that remain within sight of the victim for the entire hour and aren't incapacitated during it are the ones that are uh, involved the process can be repeated though and it often is the humanoid that drops to zero hit points as a result of this damage instantly transforms into a mean lock at full health and under the dm's control Killing the transformed victim and, most importantly, killing the mean locks that transformed them and then attempting to raise the victim from the dead is the easiest way to restore them to their original form, but otherwise only a wish spell or some sort of divine intervention can restore a transformed creature to its former state. The reduction in size from what may have been a medium-sized humanoid down to the twisted figure roughly the size of a scrawny halfling may represent be re represented by the mean locks taking turns to plunge their mandibles into the victim and slurp down gulps of liquefying fat and tissue, sloughing away from the insides of the victim as they shriek and writhe in agonized nightmare without escape, the physical pain matched by the horrendous telepathic torment they are undergoing. During the day, Mean locks confine themselves to their dark warrens, communicating with each other using their telepathy, but they never actually sleep and venture out as soon as darkness descends, or patrol around in the shadows and stench of sewers or old abandoned tunnels of ant eggs or purple worms, wending their way underneath unsuspecting ta towns and farmsteads. They use their intellect to figure out as many ways to extinguish light sources as they can, as being able to teleport through shadow is second only to their ability to paralyze a victim in its tactical value. Mean locks are well known to latch onto the trail of anyone who has disturbed the stone that seals off their tunnel. It's a self-defense mechanism, and also they just like doing that, waiting until the victim beds down for the night before they attack. Though they are so small and feeble that it takes three of them to lift and carry one medium-sized humanoid. Meanlocks are also well aware of the power of their fear aura and will carefully set up traps where they can funnel a fleeing victim right into a covered pit, giant spiderweb or some other trap, delighting in the frenzied and futile efforts of their victim to get away from them. They have a real love for torture. For them, the perfect night consists of them crawling out of their tunnel, tracking down some ultra squeaky clean goody two-shoes halfling cleric, sleeping cozy next to a low campfire, quietly dowsing the flames and zipping across the shadows to dig their filthy claws into the soft hobbit's neck, watching its little eyes snap open and a frightened cry frozen on its foaming, paralysed mouth. They then pick the halfling up and carry them back to the tunnel, where they bind the victim with old guts and leather, beat them unconscious, reducing that hit point total down, and then squirm their terrifying thoughts inside the victim's mind, where the real torture can begin. All the while, the group gathers round to puncture the halfling's flesh and slurp out the fat, transferring all manner of diseases as they do so. Smart enough to make use of creatures they can't transform into members of their own kind, mean locks will let giant vermin into their tunnels, particularly giant trapdoor spiders, cave fishes, and giant beetles. They dislike rodents, but will keep them around for food as a backup plan when pickings are slim. But there never seems to be much of a shortage of terrified humanoids in the many worlds of the Dungeons and Dragons multiverse. Almost nothing is known about the lair that they travel back to and their own dark fey underrealm. They are known to be found around the territory of other unseely creatures, particularly near the despotic estates of the twisted and evil Fomorian giants. 
There's a good adventure featuring Meanlocks called Escape from Meanlock Prison, published in uh, Dungeon Magazine back in May 2007. The location of the prison, uh, adventure is a prison, a site rich in fear, and with the cramped and compartmentalised terrain filled with crazed inmates, it's just perfect for the Meanlocks method of misdirection, fear, hit and run, and turning humanoids on each other out of fear of the unknown terror speaking into their minds from the darkness. Meanlocks are, of course, totally immune to fear, but they know their physical limitations. Often, they are forced to operate alone, without a lair or tunnels, because only one of them has been brought into the world through an insufficient amount of fear. They will busily, uh, big, they'll busy themselves with digging a lair of their own, or seek out some existing tunnels, and the sewers under a crowded city is just perfect for that. Some mean lots work under the employ of a hag, and individuals may find their way into the world frequently thanks to the hag's similar intent of spreading fear and horror in the world. The two creatures tend to share a common worldview, and the meanlocks will work with the hag willingly in small groups, seeking out the innocent and the beautiful to corrupt and destroy. Meanlocks can make noises, they can, may possibly speak, but with their telepathic ability to communicate up to 120 feet away from each other, they have no need to talk out loud. They may shriek when set on fire, or when they have their limbs lopped off by the cold steel weapon of adventurers though. If forced to fight, they have a natural armor class of 15 and an average of 31 hit points. That's reasonable. They skitter along at 30 feet per round and are pretty low to the ground, standing 2 or 3 feet tall at the most. So don't forget to let them make full use of partial cover and stuff. And even a low wall is good for full cover for such a small creature. Looking like some wretched sort of pincered demon goblin spider, they have a strength of 7. Dexterity of 15, Constitution of 12, Intelligence of 11, Wisdom of 10, and a Charisma of 8, with a passive perception of 14, and active perception checks have plus 4. They are skilled at survival, plus 2 on attempts to build traps and track down victims. They are sensitive to bright light and suffer disadvantage on attack rolls and any checks that involve sight while caught in a brightly lit area. They have 120 foot dark vision and have plus 6 on their stealth checks, so they're very sneaky. Their aura of fear has a short range of 10 feet, but they are smart enough to overlap and cover a wider area when working together, shifting around with their shadow teleport. This can move them up to 30 feet, but it's an ability they need to recharge at the start of their turns on a result of 5 or 6 on a 6-sided die roll, so they use it judiciously. They don't need to see where they are teleporting to, so they can move between rooms doors or floors or from one tunnel to, an to another tunnel nearby which is very effective in their chosen terrain. Inside their twisted tunnels give them advantage on their stealth checks if they are beyond the range of any bright light source because they are sneaking around with that moss as well. They always always try to gain advantage of surprise and they are plus four to hit one target with their claws swinging both at the target in a grabbing stab motion using all of the power of their disproportionately bloated torso. The claws inflict 2d4 plus 2 slashing damage and the target must succeed on a DC 11 constitution saving throw or be paralyzed for one minute. The target can repeat the saving throw at the end of each of its turns, ending the effect on itself on a success. And it's important to note that making the saving throw against one of these paralytic claw attacks does not make the victim immune to any future claw attacks. So... With large numbers of mean locks, the risk of rolling badly and becoming incapacitated just gets higher and higher. On the same note, victims do not become immune to the fear effect of the mean locks either. So if they crowd around a target and force those multiple saving throws, they can force the target to try and run for it, at which point they all get an opportunity attack, and even with relatively feeble claw damage, they can bring down much larger humanoids with relative ease. Be wary when fighting any large group of creatures in 5th edition D&D, and be particularly wary fighting any creatures with the ability to paralyze their enemy. It is a killer combination, and the Meanlock is built to exploit it. They are challenge rating 2 for a very good reason. The aspects of helplessness and torture, the loss of control and agency over a player character can be particularly traumatic for sensitive players who have never experienced that sort of occurrence in the game. And I strongly advise against Dungeon Masters uh, to use mean locks in games at conventions and public, public gatherings where the players and Dungeon Master don't know each other very well. Just don't do it. Of course, all bets are off if your regular games with your friends are... Uh, where you're basically all on board and scaring the crap out of each other and really enjoy the truly horrific death of a player character or innocent non-player character because mean locks are possibly better 
then a cavern stocked with carrying crawlers or a pond full of chul or a graveyard full of ghouls for that and as always know your audience and don't be a dick if you like the lore in these videos don't forget to check out videos by fellow forgotten realms lore masters check out my channels tab where i have a full list of them for you to enjoy and explore also shout out to the facebook group dungeons and dragons philippine community hey guys how's it going Please hit the like button if you made it this far, subscribe if you like what I do, check out my Patreon for some exclusive content and all the full scripts of these videos, buy some merchandise, wear your geek with pride and as always, thanks for listening and I'll be back with more for you very soon.